How we doing, church? Happy 2022. This is the first time I've seen you. So glad you are in the house today. If you're watching um, online, podcasting, uh, listening via unfiltered radio, wherever you're at around uh, Florida, Central Florida, so glad you guys are with us today. And we are starting a brand new series I'm going to dive into called On the Right Track that I'm super excited about to start this year. Um, And if it's not helpful for you, it'll be helpful for me. So, because here's the thing. Um, And I think this is true of all of us. Um, I feel pretty confident about this, but we've all had those kind of moments in life where we get to the end of a decision or the end of some certain season and we say, I should have seen that coming. Like I should have identified that. That should have been clear sooner. I should have realized that that was heading toward being a train wreck a lot earlier than I did. And one of the things that is just true about human nature, and this is just the thing, is that so often there is a disconnect between the track that we are on and the destination that we want to arrive at. And then you get to the end of some season and you kind of look back and you're like, I don't, it's so obvious now. Like I should have seen that. I should have been clued into that. But then the other side of it is true too, is that on the other side, you said you should have seen that coming because you watch somebody else and it just seems so clear and they're surprised, but you're not surprised. And in some cases, nobody around them, none of their friends are surprised. They're like, I can't believe he broke up with me. And you're like, he's been trying to break up with you for three months. Like, how did you not see that? Like, you know, the financially it ends up in this place and you're like, everybody saw that that's where this, you know, it like, it's, it was such a stupid decision and we didn't say anything, but how did you not see that? How did you not know that? I mean, isn't this a true thing? We have crystal clear insight into the stupidity of other people's decisions, right? I mean, it's just true. Like it is so obvious. It's so clear. It's so out there. And yet it's so hard to see in the mirror. Like, and that's the question. Why can't we see what other people can see? And why can we see what oftentimes they can't see? Like, what is that dynamic? Now, here's the other part of it though, too, if we're really honest is like, sometimes we do see. Like we, we do see it coming. We do have like some kind of inclination. There is a tension of like, eh, this might end bad. I maybe shouldn't ask her out. I, I don't know if this is a good financial decision. Like you, you know, and you just decide to look the other way anyway. You like, you kind of see it, but you just decide to ignore it. And so the question you got to ask is why do we do that? And we'll answer that question later in this series, but here, let me get to some bad news first. And then it'll, it'll get progressively better. But the bad news is this, is that for all of us, and this will help kind of with where we're going, is most personal problems can't be fixed. I knew that wasn't going to be an applause line. And most personal problems, welcome to church, most personal problems can't be fixed. Like you can fix a lot of times a computer, you can fix an appliance sometimes that goes bad. Like you, you, can, you can fix things. And, and here's what's different about those things is in some cases, especially if it's fairly new, you can fix it, you can replace a part and it's better than ever. Like it is like new, it's like it never happened. The only problem is like life isn't that way. Like our lives are not that way. Like you can walk through something and on the other side, you can cope with it. You can decide to learn from your mistakes so you don't repeat them. In some cases, you can leverage those at some level for your future, but your past is still your past. Like, it's not like it doesn't happen or it never happened. And what is so important is God redeems and God restores, but it's just good to avoid certain things. Like there's certain things that are avoidable. Now, let me say one thing around this before I get to some better news is here's what's really important though as a church. All of us have our stuff. Like the church should be just kind of one giant gathering that goes, you too? Because all of us have stuff. And if somehow you have been pushed into the illusion that somebody's stuff is bigger or greater than yours, or there's whole groups of people that are like those people, you have completely missed the theology of the entire New Testament. Because unless you are Jesus, and you're not, Unless you are Jesus, there's no us and them. There's no, you've got this, but I, you know, I'm, here's where I'm at. There's no categories. There's no, no dividing walls. It is just Jesus and everybody who needs help. And newsflash, you are in the category of everybody who needs help. Like that's where all of us are. So just look around you. Everybody is in the same boat. Your mother-in-law needs help. You need help. The Republican to your right needs help. 
the Democrat to your left needs help, the libertarian needs help, the whole group of people that you've demonized needs help, your whole group needs help. And if you have been pushed into a self-righteous theological system that somehow categorizes, you have missed the message of the New Testament. We are all on an equal plane. We all have dysfunction and it's Jesus and all the people who need help. Could we be any clearer? Like that's the church. But there are certain things because come on, isn't there enough, enough unavoidable regret and loss in life? You don't wanna pile it up unnecessarily. And so there are certain things and there are a lot of personal problems. In fact, most personal problems that can be avoided. So this whole series is about this, how to avoid what is avoidable so that you have less to cope with later. Now, here's the thing, here's, a, here's what is at the epicenter of where we're going and at the epicenter of how to get your life on the right track or make sure you're on the right track or get back on the right track. It all centers around a singular principle. Now, let me real quick, and I know like some of you, this is gonna be, okay, I know this already, but sometimes it just has to be surfaced for you. Let me tell you a couple things about a principle real quick that maybe you haven't thought of, you didn't put it in this language. A principle is not a rule that you follow. In fact, what I'm gonna talk about could be termed, and I, I learned this early on in like undergrad, and I, I had a couple kind of mentors that put language around this and then seminary, but what I would call the principle of direction. But here's the thing about a principle. A principle is not a rule that you follow. In fact, in some ways, principles follow you. A principle is not something that you choose to apply. It's not like, well, okay, I need that, I gotta apply this. No, it kind of applies itself to you, whether you know about it or not. And a principle is not a law that you can break. It's none of those things, it's just a principle. In fact, in a lot of cases, if you ignore a principle, a principle has the potential to break you. But it's not a law that you can break, it's not something that you can go and just apply, it's not a rule that you follow. Now, let me give you one illustration to help get your mind around this from something that you will not remember most likely from high school, but anybody remember Archimedes' principle? Um, that's what I thought. So Archimedes, it basically, every time uh, you like get on a cruise ship, if you ventured back into that, every time you get on a boat, um, every time that you go swimming, I mean, it, this always apply, applies in any of those scenarios. It's just a principle. And you could like go, well, I shouldn't apply to me because I don't know about it. That's kind of unfair. Well, that's the nature of a principle. It just is. It's just true. It's gonna do its thing whether you are aware of it or not. And Archimedes' principle, maybe you're aware, like ultimately led to the principle of buoyancy, which this is crazy, maybe just to me, but like in the third century, he explained to the world what had been happening in the world since the beginning of the world. Like he didn't invent it. He didn't like, well, this would be a cool concept. He just discovered what had always been. That is the nature of a principle. A principle is just gonna apply itself whether you know about it or not. A principle is just true. A principle is just going to do its thing. And so he put in the language of mathematics, this whole idea of why pebbles sink and why cruise ships float because that's what principles do. You discover them, they're just at work in the world. And so principles are experienced, principles are explained, but they're not invented. And you can either discover and leverage for the sake of your benefit, for your life, for your decision-making, where you're going with your future, or you can ignore principles and in a lot of cases end up in a place where you suffer the consequences. Here's what's really important if you're like, oh, I wanna hear the voice of God. God set the world up to work according to principles, cause and effect, sow and reap. It's how he manufactured the universe. And so this is so important. When you lean into principles around you, it is actually leaning into the voice of God because God has created the world to work that way. So all of this is true for the principle of direction. Now, real quick, and then I'll promise I'll get to a couple verses and I'll explain this, but this is really important to know. There's a difference between a solution and a direction. So when I talk about the principle of direction, a solution and direction are not the same thing because when you get lost and you're not sure where you're at, you don't stop and ask for a solution, right? Just go with me. You stop and ask for a direction. Now, this is something that, um, has followed me um, for the, I, I just, I'm not great with directions. Um, GPS was the most amazing thing that's ever been invented. It's cut years off of my life, just wandering around, not being able to find things. Um, the only issue is my wife is one of those people who is confidently wrong directionally. 
but she thinks she, so I, even though the sophisticated English voice that leads me around everywhere that I trust implicitly has not steered me wrong many times, we will be going somewhere in the last minute, Nicole will be so sure that no, no, that's the exit. That's where you need to turn right there. In some cases, I risk the lives of our family to turn and get to that place. I've ignored the voice that I trust of the sophisticated English woman who constantly talks to me and leads me where I need to go. And I, move, and I think 100% of the time, and I'm not over-exaggerating this, she has been wrong every time. <clears throat> she is confidently sure, uh, even though she has a decade long track record of not getting it right a single time. And it's my issue for continuing um, to listen to her. And I love her, but she needs to stop that. (laughs) And so in all of that, and I've experienced this so many times, like you don't stop and ask for solutions. You stop and ask for directions. And here's what's true directionally that, you know, like there is no instant solution. There's no instant fix. It just doesn't work that way. So in terms of life, in terms of like where we're headed, in terms of what maybe is ahead for us with our future, we get to where we should be the same way we got to where we shouldn't be. See, every day all over like the United States, all over the world, like people will come to pastors and counselors and therapists, which by the way, I'm a massive fan of. Um, We even provide help for people who need counseling if they need financial help and we resource to great counselors. We have a ton that come to our church, therapists and counselors. I'm not great at that. In fact, I think you should be leery of pastors that try to counsel Go get an LMHC and licensed therapist, and they're amazing. And, and by the way, they know your problems generally in about three minutes, um, but they allow you to figure them out, and they lead you there brilliantly. They're so good at it. I'm not good at it, because sometimes I can spot your problem in three minutes too, but I shut down the conversation. I'm like, I know your problem. We can end this right here. Here's what you need to do, and that just doesn't work, so I don't counsel. So... Um, you, the, the, whole, the whole thing though is people will come to counselors and therapists and they'll wanna fix. Like, cause I'm here, or here's what's happening relationally or here where I, here's where I find myself where all this stuff has gone off the rails and I need you to fix me and I need you to show me how to fix this. And the reality is there's no fix. The reality is there is no instant solution. The reality is like it, it can't just be to change because they don't need a problem that can be fixed or they don't need a solution to a problem to be fixed. They need a direction ultimately to change. And until they change directions, nothing is gonna change about their life. And a lot of us know this intuitively because you'll have a friend walking through something and like you want to help them and you realize there's no way that I can fix this. There's no way that this just goes away. They need a directional change in regard to their life. And here's the thing, when things start to go off the rails and you're like, I need a solution, I need a fix, this needs to get better. There is no immediate solution. There is no immediate fix. But if you change directions, eventually your life will change. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in his most famous message. And I looked at a couple of these verses several months ago, but I wanna look at them again real quick in a different context because this so sets up where we're gonna go now for the next three weeks after this. But at the very end of his most famous message ever, and you know these verses well, and I've dealt with them before, but he sets this up so well when he says this in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice... Meaning, like you may be at one of a couple places right now because for some of us, there's a direction that needs to be changed and you've been living in the wrong direction for a long time. In fact, that may be where you're at right now. You are just living in the wrong direction. And here's something really important to note is that you can live in the wrong direction in a season of your life and be happier than you've ever been before which is why it is so difficult and so deceiving. And in like directions, like you're driving somewhere and you get lost. And isn't it true most of the time, you don't know exactly when you got lost. If you did, you could just, well, back up 30 feet. That was the lost point. Like we, if we back up, then we'll know we'll be found again. It just doesn't work that way. Like you finally discover, well, I'm lost. I don't know exactly when we got lost. And the same is true in life. You don't wake up one day to go, well, I'm just gonna make this area of my life a train wreck starting today at noon. No, you start to move in a direction where all of a sudden, I'm not sure when it got off the rails, but I'm just lost. 
I, things aren't right. I'm not where ultimately I wanted to be. And so Jesus says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, meaning like there is a directional change that needs to happen. You need to not just believe something or intend to do something. You need to do something. Now, here's where a lot of us grew up in terms of religious context is you maybe grew up in church environment, whatever that looked like. And the more you felt bad about yourself, like the better it was. So like you felt bad about yourself and then you just went home and this whole religious dynamic was created that the worst you felt about you and the more shame you felt toward you and the more condemnation you felt toward you, you felt you had a better connection with God. You know what I'm talking about? Like I feel so much shame and so close to God right now. It never changed anything. You never did anything. You just thought that's how it was supposed to work. I just feel shame and condemnation and somehow I have a better connection with God. I just wanna tell you, if that was your religious upbringing, I'm not sure that you've ever really been introduced to what it means to follow Jesus. Because shame and condemnation do, do not ever lead to lasting change. And to leverage that to think, well, that's what it means to speak the truth and follow Jesus. And we don't want to water it down. No, no, no. The only thing that leads to is church trauma and the need for therapy, which is a lot of people who listen to us or attend our church. It's why Jesus said this, and I don't know how we missed it. It is my kindness that leads you to repentance. Kindness is always Jesus' lead story because guilt, condemnation was taken care of at the cross so we'd never have to visit it again. And now we have a loving God that says, I want you to go in a different direction and I love you and I want you to be my son and my daughter. And it's my kindness that perpetuates and is the catalyst for change, not anything else. So if you wanna know what it means to preach the gospel, the good news, that is the good news. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is inviting you into something new and it's his kindness that is the catalyst for your life to change. So Jesus is like, therefore, anyone who puts these words of mine into practice will experience immediate relief relationally, financially, professionally, and spiritually. Some of you have no idea, but that's not the verse. (laughs) Or they will have discovered the fix for all of their problems. That's not the verse either. Jesus never promises a fix. It's why this is such a dangerous dynamic. If there's anybody that stands on a stage with a mic strapped to their head and says, if you just pray this prayer and you just have this much faith and if you just believe this, everything's gonna work out okay, you should run as fast as you can away from that religious environment because they want something from you. Jesus never promised a fixed, Jesus points to the way forward and Jesus points to the way out and says, it's not gonna be immediate, but I want you to follow me. There's no magic prayer. There's no magic, you just believe this. There's no amount of faith. This is just how the world works. This is how Jesus set the world up to work. It's just principles. And I've set the world up to work a certain way and I want you to follow me. And then here's what he says. Many of you are familiar, familiar with it. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, He's like a wise man, not necessarily smart. Like there's some really highly educated intellectual people. They have no wisdom, not necessarily smart, not necessarily talented, not necessarily resourced, but he's like, they're wise. If you begin to follow me, if you pay attention to me, if you pay attention to how I've set the world up to work, like you'll be wise. Meaning, and again, I've talked about this before, but wisdom is just understanding that all of life is connected. I can't make decisions in this direction and then just because I'm sincere end up in this direction in terms of my life. It just doesn't work that way. I can't make this decision even though I know it's gonna end badly for me, but somehow think, well, I'm just gonna be different or I'm smarter or you know, it'll, it'll just work out better or I'll just pray my way over here. It just doesn't work that way. Like it is directional principle. All of life is connected. Your past is connected to your present. It's a really great indicator of your future. And the direction that you're going in terms of your life and your decision-making ultimately determines your destination. So he says, anybody who hears my words, how I've set the world up to work and practices them, they are wise and they build or they've built. And building, like, it requires process. It requires time. It requires habit. It requires discipline. We hate this word or these words. It's delayed gratification. Like it is, there's no immediate fix. 
There's no immediate solution. But he's like, if you wanna know what it looks like to begin to live your life in a different direction, the wise person begins to build his house. And house just means this, your house is your life. Your house is your emotional well-being for your future. Your house is your integrity. Your house is your priorities. Your house is like all of those things in regard to your reputation or even your finances or your relationships. He's like, the wise person does the unenviable, it's gonna take a lot longer, building his house on the rock. And just real quick, again, you've heard this. Building on the rock is hard. It's expensive. It's time consuming. There are some days if you built anything or watch something be built, my, my sister's building a house right now and it's been a nightmare for them. And there's some days where it just feels like this is never gonna happen. And it, there's no progress being made because when you're building anything, there's certain days where you get to the end of it and it just feels like a waste of time. It feels like a waste of effort. It maybe feels like a waste of money. And what you are building toward is not immediately accessible. It's not move in ready for a while. And Jesus is like, this is not what we want. This is not how American culture tends to work. But if you wanna live your life and move your life in a different direction, especially if you are currently on the wrong track, you've got to listen to me. You've got to move into this category of wisdom to build your house on the rock. And that takes time. And then he says this, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man, which just means this, fools don't have wisdom because they live as if life is disconnected. And come on, before you skirt by that too quick, or like, well, I'm not really a fool. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter how much money you make. We are all capable of making really stupid decisions despite knowing the right decision. And the person who is a fool or lives as if life is disconnected is kind of this idea of now is now and later is later. And I can make this decision even though I feel like it's moving me in a direction I don't wanna go and somehow I'm just gonna end up in a different place. Somehow it's just gonna be different for me. I'm unique. My situation is unique. I don't know, whatever. Like I'll just, we'll just get divorced or I'll just get another job or nobody's gonna know about it. And we live in a direction as if life is not connected. I feel like, I mean, this is one thing I thought of. I almost feel like we live like an electronic device. Like it's not that big a deal and we'll just reset and reboot. Like it's, we'll just, it's just another, relate. if it doesn't work out, it's fine. It's just a relationship or whatever. Like we can just try something new or if I end up with the regrets, whatever, we'll, we'll figure it out. And so we have this idea that like, it's not working. I'm just gonna like unplug my life somehow. I'm gonna count to 10. I'm gonna plug it back in. I'm gonna reboot and then I'll just find myself and it'll be fine. The only problem is a lot of times finding yourself, it's yourself that's the problem. And like you just find yourself in another season with the same dysfunction and your heavenly father says to you, listen, you were made in my image. I created you for a purpose. I have a destiny and a will for your life. I want you to live your life in a different direction. I want you to recognize that what you do today is gonna be your present tomorrow and ultimately it's gonna influence your future. It's not disconnected. You are not unique you will not somehow move around the consequences. This is how I've set the world up to work. And if you practice and live as if life is disconnected, you're a fool who built his house on the sand. Because that's quick and that's easy. And that's all about today. And that's immediate. And the assumption is that the weather today is gonna be the weather tomorrow. And it rarely is. It almost never is. And it wasn't. Because the rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. And the implication is there was no fix. There was no solution. Total loss. Because you spent a lot of time, not as much time to do it the right way, but you spent a lot of time building in this direction. And then when the storm came, all of it was a total loss. And the implication is kind of this, hey, you should have seen that coming. <laughs> you should have known that wasn't gonna end well. 
You should have known eventually things are not gonna be up and to the right. Something's gonna come your way and it's not gonna end well for you. And you should have been able to look to the future to recognize the direction that you were headed was not a good direction. But when the rain came down, the stream rose and the wind blew and beat against the first house, the one that was built on the rock took a lot more time, not immediately accessible. It did not fall because those people are so lucky. You're like, well, I need to write that. And that's not, that's, that's not the verse either. Because that's what we think, right? It just always works out for them. It just always comes together. Somehow it just seems to always, not that it's perfect because nothing's perfect. There's no promise of pain-free, problem-free. But those people, you just like, how does it always track in that direction for you? Like, God just doesn't love me. God just doesn't hear me. If God heard me, this wouldn't happen. She wouldn't have left. We wouldn't be in this position. I wouldn't be dealing with this. The reality is they weren't lucky and they deal with all the same crap that you deal with, but they've lived their life in a different direction. And it's not about God's anger or God's absence or God's wrath. It's God going, I've invited you to follow me and I've set the world up to work according to principles. And I want you to live your life in my direction. But verse 25, it didn't fall. This is the actual verse because it had its foundation on the rock, rock cause and effect, sow and reap, principle of direction. And then I love these last couple of verses. In verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Basically, finally makes sense. Thank you for saying something that we understand. Thank you for knowing what we need to do because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Here's the thing, here's why I wanted to do this series. Like no overstatement, this is the thing that legit breaks my heart. It does. Like being in the role that I've been for a lot of years and watching a lot of people, and I just think like I have sometimes a different vantage point, just like people have into my life, but there's so many people and you watch so many decisions being made. And this is the thing that legit breaks my heart. When I watch people choose a direction and a track that has no chance of leading them to where they wanna end up in life. And more importantly, when they choose a direction or a track that guarantees them not to lead them in the direction that God wants for their life, the plan that God has for their life, the destiny that God has for their life, and to watch that happen to go, the direction that you're going, the exit that you are taking, you have no shot no matter how much you pray to end up where you wanna end up. And come on, like, unlike directions, I mean, directions, you get lost somewhere, you have a fight with your wife and, you know, you arrive a few minutes late and generally, you know, you talk it out over the next 48 hours and then you move on with your life, (laughs) right? And it's fine. You get lost in terms of life, you lose whole seasons. In some cases, you you lose watching your kids grow up for a, a season of time. You lose your 20s. You lose your 30s. You lose a marriage that you can't get back. And it's not just that you, you were late, you missed it completely. Because we can't wish our way, talk our way, or pray our way back in time to the moment where we got off track. And so here's, here's the principle of direction I wanna talk about for the next three weeks. Your direction determines your destination. Your, this is what wise people understand. Your direction, where you're headed, the decisions that you're making right now, where you see the trajectory of that relationship, where you're headed financially, what's going on ethically and morally, where you're going on career-wise, the decisions and the priorities that you are making where it's like, well, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And all the while you're moving in a direction and eventually you're gonna arrive at a destination. Your direction in any area of your life, in your life in general, your direction determines your destination. And the best way to predict your future is to understand the track and the direction that you are currently on. So one of the things I feel like that I have to do when I'm on the road a lot is, um, is like drive for other people. 
Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, I just feel like, and maybe it's not, like I, I was in Atlanta recently. I think they're ridiculous drivers. Like, and there's uh, lots of other areas of the country. I just feel like everybody drives insane, uh, like around here. So I'm always on the road. Nicole will make fun of me of kind of driving like a grandpa. Cause I'm like, I'm not just, I'm not driving for me. I'm driving for all these other people on the road that I just feel like are out of control. And maybe you don't relate or you are those drivers. I don't know. Like, I don't understand, but like, I just feel that way. And one, one day, this is back uh, several years ago, it's probably five, six years ago, but you always, uh, you know, underestimate. So it was probably 10 years ago, but we were, Nicole and I sitting at a stoplight and there was this huge intersection and it's like four lanes going this way. And it's, it's kind of like off center. And so where we were at, the traffic, once they got the light would come this way and around. And it was fairly, it was one of those intersections where it's, it's like a steep turn. So you got to come around and you got to make a pretty good turn to get onto that other um, like four lane road. And, and we're sitting there and I'm always, my eyes are always going, I'm always watching for people and it's just how I drive. And I'm seeing this truck come to that intersection and start to make the turn and it's raining. And like, obviously like where we were at, the roads are slick and I see this guy. And you know, when you see something that's about to happen and it's like in slow motion, where like, there's about to be some, this is gonna go bad. There's about to be a collision. I don't think he's gonna make the turn like this. And so I'm just watching it and it feels like slow motion, but it's like milliseconds. And I watch this truck come around and he loses control and it slides and the truck just flips over and it ends up in a ditch right in front of like a circle K on that corner. And it's just like that emotion that you feel if you've ever watched something like that. And, and I have a couple times, unfortunately, and, and so is Nicole, but I, I watched the whole thing go down. And then because I'm already frustrated at drivers on the road, what do you think the first thing I did was? I got up, I, I went to the corner of the Circle K and I just started, I wasn't sure if he's all right yet, but I was just like, are you an idiot? Like, how dare you drive like this on the road? And you kind of deserve to be in a ditch in front of the Circle K. No, I didn't. And I probably should have shared this with you first. He was, he was fine. He, was, he ended up being fine. Praise God. But what do you think I did? I, in that moment, I had so much concern for this guy that I didn't know. So much concern for, is this dude okay? And that thing starts to race in your heart and like, you know, people are already out and, and helping and uh, like immediately, and the paramedics were amazing. But like immediately, like, I hope he's okay. I, I hope everything's all right. And there is so much concern for this nameless, faceless individual that if he would have made the turn, I would have been upset with him. And my whole point in that is this, I am a flawed human being. I'm a flawed individual. But if I can have that much concern and that much care and that much love for somebody that I don't even know that I never met, can you imagine your heavenly father? Can you imagine your heavenly, and your life might feel like it's in the ditch of a circle K right now. Can you imagine the love of your heavenly father. It's why the invitation of our church, and I will never apologize and I will never back down from this. The invitation of our church is the invitation of Jesus. It is not an invitation to fix yourself. It is not an invitation to change. Initially, it's not even an invitation to believe. It is an invitation. You see this all throughout the New Testament. It is an invitation to follow Jesus, to get to know Jesus, to hang out with Jesus, to get close to Jesus. And Jesus' invitation is this. If you follow me, I will make your life better and I'll make you better at life. Not easier. Life's going to suck sometimes. It's going to be hard. Things are going to go off the rails. Not easier, better. Love, joy, peace, contentment. Jesus would say it's found in me. And by the way, that is the thing that your soul longs for. And the scriptures say this, you were created, whether you realize it or not, you were manufactured to bring glory to Jesus. And all that means is this, that you live your life in such a way that Jesus is at the center of it. And you live your life in such a way that says, Jesus is better and Jesus way is better. And not only do you bring glory to God, which is how you've been manufactured and created to live your life. The byproduct is Jesus way is better. Your life, not pain-free, not problem-free, nobody's promising that, but your life will be better because that's what Jesus invites you into. My ways, my wisdom, my principles, my direction, it's better than yours. It's better than your plans. It's better than your will. 
My destiny trumps everything that you're thinking for in terms of your life. And my way is the way that leads to ultimate peace. And so he says, follow me. Follow me into eternal life, which generally we completely misinterpret. Nowhere in the scripture does that exclusively relate to heaven. Every time you see it in the scripture, eternal life means the moment you place your faith and trust in Jesus to believe that he lived the perfect life that you couldn't and that he died the death that you should have died, all of humanity should have died for our sin, our dysfunction, because there's just Jesus and everybody that needs help. And then three days later, he walked out of a grave alive. That as you begin to place your trust in him and follow him, eternal life starts at that moment. Jesus is inviting you into abundant and full life right now. And then he authenticated all of that by giving away his life and taking it up again. And he says to you, says to me, follow me. You, come on, you are going to end up somewhere on purpose in life, or you're gonna end up somewhere in life. And my whole desire and invitation, the invitation of Jesus is that you would end up somewhere on purpose. And so he says to you, I want you to follow me. And if you follow me, you will live life on purpose with a purpose. And so what you may be looking for to start the year is a solution and a fix. Jesus is inviting you into a directional change. And if you will take him seriously, if you will begin to follow him into that, you change directions, it won't be immediate. You'll have to sow and reap your way into it. You get to where you wanna be the same way you got to where you don't wanna be. But if you change directions eventually, your life will change. And I'm just telling you, because I just wanna be so clear. The goal for Jesus is not to change your life. The goal for Jesus is that you would know him. And the goal, the byproduct of your life beginning to change as you begin to change direction is that you will experience what your soul longs for. And that is communion and relationship with Jesus. Would you just stand with me all over the house? And right now, if you're watching somewhere, if you're listening via unfiltered radio, I'd love for you to just join me in this moment. But we just bow your heads, close your eyes just out of respect for people who are around you. And in this one moment, I, I, I cannot close this without giving some an opportunity, even though this, this hasn't been centrally articulated. I didn't spend a ton of time on this, but I just know how the spirit of God works. This is your moment to say, I've never really begun a relationship to, to follow Jesus. And, and this may be the moment and following Jesus may not be, I'm, I'm placing all my trust in him, but I'm at least gonna begin to investigate. I'm gonna at least begin to take steps. I'm gonna apply things. And as you begin to do that, you may be surprised about what Jesus begins to do in your life. But for others of you, this is the moment where you're at that crossroads to say, I'm, I wanna place my faith and trust in Jesus. And the scripture, the gospel, which just means good news says this, if you believe that Jesus came as God to live the life that you couldn't live a perfect life, died the death you should have died on the cross, that I should have died on the cross, and then walked out of a grave alive three days later by simply transferring your trust to him and away from your ability to try to earn your way to God or be good enough. The scripture says the moment you make that transfer of trust in your own heart and your own mind, you become a son and a daughter of God. I wanna give you that chance right now, whether you're physically in the house or you're watching somewhere right now, you can pray this prayer after me. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's your declaration of trust to say, Jesus, I believe that you're God. Right now in this moment, this can be your declaration of trust. Jesus, I believe that you're God. I believe that you lived the life that I couldn't live. Three days later, I believe that you rose from the grave after dying on the cross for my sin. And right now, I wanna place my trust in you to forgive me and to save me. And if that's you with nobody looking around, would you just lift up your hand to go, that's me in this moment. I'm making a declaration of faith and trust in Jesus for the first time, yeah. Would you just keep it up? Somebody's gonna put a card in your hand. You don't have to do anything with that. But if you choose to fill that out, we'd love to give you more information about this journey. You can take it to any of our connect tents. But just real quick, if this is your moment to place your faith and trust in Christ, would you just lift up your hand to go, this is the moment where I wanna begin a journey with Jesus. Jesus, I thank you so much for what you're doing um, in this moment in the hearts and the lives of people. And I pray that wherever we are at, you would apply this so specifically and practically to us, which is what you are capable of doing. It's what you do. And so I pray that you would do that in the hearts and lives of people physically in the room, those watching online. 
I pray that those even maybe outside of this building who've made decisions would text Centerpoint to 94,000 to just take a next step in this journey. And I just pray that you would meet us wherever we are. And we pray this in your incredible name, the name of Jesus, amen. And would you put your hands together to celebrate those who place their faith and trust in Christ today?